Hey, my name is Perto Pelen, and you're watching the Break It Down show. So let's start. Yeah, Perto's joining us from Fre uh, from Finland, and um, I, I, here's one of the things. That, so I'm having technical difficulties with the show recently, for everybody in the audience to hear. You know, so everything's fine. It's just like if a piece of equipment breaks, you have to sort out which one broke, and so. I'm trying to sort this out, and you got to buy something and return something. Oh my gosh, it's been crazy the last week trying to sort this stuff out. And so this is the problem with technology. The bonus of technology is is here we are talking across an ocean, um, a continent and a half, and and I just I love that we get to do this stuff, man. Thanks for coming on the Break It Down show. Of course, of course. You know there was a joke in Silicon Valley when we talked about AI. We always said that AI is easy, but AV is hard. <laughs> so oh. <laughs> something goes wrong, right? Nobody knows how to fix it. Yeah, yeah. You slide the USB card, or you know, thumb, you know, drive in, and you're like, and it didn't work. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. And then you got to go, and this would be great, a great segue. Then you got to go ask. I, I like to Bing things, but then you have to go Google or Bing it to figure out what the answer is. And and one of the problems is that so I'm working off a of Microsoft Surface, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, Microsoft and Elgato, and these are two gold standards in their own industry. The Elgato uh, video card does not talk to the Surface laptop for some yeah. crazy reason, you know, and it's like, who would ever guess that? Who would ever? <laughs> so, and, yeah. and I wonder how, how, how did people manage before Google? Like, I, I don't remember that time because obviously, like I was only a couple of years old when <laughs> Google, you know, got, when we got it. So how did people find answers <laughs> to yeah. this? I, I can tell you because I was alive then. And this is great. We discussed this the other day. So whatever the question is, what is the best breed of dog for me? Then you open your phone book, look mm -hmm. for the local library. You call the library and you ask the librarian. The librarian's like, right. we have 15 books on dog breeds, um, but people around here like to get the Cocker Spaniel. You should try that. And that's how you did it. You either went down to the library or in the librarian was literally Google. Imagine mm -hmm. how crazy that is. And the librarians were, they loved it. They loved it when you called and asked them hard questions because they were just this body of knowledge. Isn't that crazy? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, to feel that appreciated when somebody really wants to ask you stuff. You know, I, I once was wondering if I had to explain Google in the 70s or 80s. You know, yeah. how would have I how could have could have I explained it? Because back then I couldn't have said or used the terms like internet or algorithm or search engine because that wouldn't necessarily mean anything to anybody. So how would you explain Google in the 70s? So I actually came up with this this answer that we have developed an answering machine, right? But the thing is, if I had told somebody in the 70s that, hey, we have this answering machine, like whatever you have in, on, on your mind, you just ask, you just type it in, and it gives you, you know, a list of answers collected from around the world, they would have, you know, probably said that I'm crazy. Like, how would an answering machine function? <laughs> like, it's impossible thought. And yeah. today, it's easy to understand because we have internet and search engine and algorithms and stuff. But the same thing today, if I sit, told somebody that, hey, we're going to have teleportation, you know, something as absurd, people will be like, oh, it's difficult to imagine. It can never happen. But maybe it's easy to understand soon uh, when we get hmm, hmm, and hmm, you know. So, you know what's funny about your uh, explanation? I even have to challenge you on that because for a long time, we never called voicemail voicemail. We called it an answering machine. Right. And so you're like, I have to translate this now. And that's like more like late 70s, early 80s uh, before we transition into voicemail. But even that is confusing because you're like, oh, so it, it answers your phone. And you're like, no, this is a question answering machine. And it's yeah. it's hard to explain the future, it's even to the past. It's, it's You're right. right about that. I think especially when we try to kind of understand the future as, you know, a ne new version of the old. Mm. Uh, and quite often, it's not a variation. It's it's completely new things. And in that case, it might be difficult to kind of plant that idea into somebody's head. I grew up just outside of the Silicon Valley, in the Bay Area, and so I recall like when, and I'll say the words hackers because that that wasn't what they were called back then. But mm -hmm. all of these people were into this, and they were establishing the industry. My my friend's dad had an Apple computer, like a Lisa computer, like early on, and right. so we were all trying to understand like, yeah, but what's this thing good for? Cause I want to go outside and throw a ball against the wall. And that's like mm -hmm. my favorite way to play games and literally played ball against the wall for thousands of hours. Right. Yeah. 
And and um, they're like, well, let's give her recipes. And I'm like, but we have cards. We have a whole index. I'm like, a library has thousands of index cards of things. Mm. And and now you look at like and what like every second of the day we we uh, you know there's this entire study a new field of study on cyborgs you know, cyborg anthropology because we all I have a hearing aid in my ear right. Uh, we're right. all cyborgs in some in some sense, you know. Maybe we have laser cut eyes. Yeah. You know? I mean, you have glasses, so yeah. that's kind of a cyborg technology. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It, so when we talk about the future and Google and everything and, and the way we have access to all this information, so I used to have a show called Popping the Bubble, and it mm-hmm. was a technology focused when I, when I lived in the Bay, and I got to talk to all kinds of futurists and people like you that that cover these kind of topics. And one of the things that we talked about quite a bit was. We have access to every bit of information ever, right? Mm. But wisdom is not readily available on Google or Bing or or anywhere on Facebook. It's hard to find some wisdom right, on Facebook, right. you know? You know, I, I think that's a, it's a fair point you're making there because, you know, the access to information has obviously increased, but the skill of using that information or the knowledge of understand the context that hasn't increased necessarily in the world which means yes you can google you know your, your like what's what's wrong in your body but it doesn't make you a doctor like you you won't know when it's actually healed completely you don't know what to do even though you were right that this is what is wrong with my with my body so i, I think that's it's very important today to remember that you know the information revolution didn't create a curiosity revolution. <laughs> like, the internet is quite a bad tool if we just only use it to you know, strengthen what we already believe in. So in that sense, it, it didn't make us better. You know, it, it, it outperformed yeah. it because yes, it obviously Google internet holds much more information than what anybody can, can do, but it kind of doesn't teach us right and wrong. <laughs> so, mm. One of the things about wisdom, too, is that it's a collection of lessons in life, right? And mm-hmm. and even if you're wrong or your own direction or your own style, because okay, there's people that are individualists, there's people that are, um, and I'm saying communists, but people who believe in the communal sense. And I don't mean communists. I mean, you know, just like right. they want to work together. And there's all kinds of things in between that. that Some of us have to learn things the hard way. Some of us will accept the lesson from the past. When I was a kid growing up, there was a guy called Evil Knievel, and he would jump his motorcycle, which was not designed for jumping, and he yeah. would jump over buses and, and over Grand Canyons and all kinds of things, and we loved him as a kid. We loved stuntmen. There was a movie called Hooper that came out in the 70s, and we mm-hmm. all just wanted to be stuntmen, and so we would jump off of stuff. And I don't know a young boy anywhere in the world that hasn't looked at the roof of their dwelling and said, I should jump off that, you know? Right. And then they do. And then eventually we learn, like, any adult can go, hey, pair two, uh, probably don't want to jump off that roof. Yes. It's a really bad idea. Right. Even, trust me, I've done it a couple of times. You shouldn't do mm-hmm. it. And then what's pair two going to do? He's jumping. You know, we all have to jump off the roof sometimes to acquire some of these lessons and, and process them into wisdom. Uh oh. I think pair two stuck or I'm stuck. All right. I'm going to kick. Is he unstuck? Are you unstuck? Okay, good. Okay. Okay. So I think a similar type of lesson is that, you know, everybody told you when you were young not to put your tongue into the metal pole when it's freezing cold outside. And you knew that it, 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 it's not a good thing. And, and still some people, maybe they were too curious because they just wanted to try it out. But the thing is, experimentation always leads to lessons learned. And in that sense, I think the courage to try new things, try out, you know, stuff is, is kind of a good thing because it leads to, you know, wisdom maybe. Um, but I guess at the end of the day, it's it's like learning comes from the reflection after we tried something. You know, it's, it's always the moment after when we ask ourselves, so what was it a good thing or not? Um, so I think it's, it's always like important to as a teacher, as an educator, you know, to, to recognize the, like teachable moments. Like those are the moments when the person really learns the lesson. Okay, don't do that again. So usually it happens after something has happened. You know, you know one of the other things, by the way, you're not the first person from Finland uh, on the show. We've had a couple others. And one of huh? them is a colonel and teaches at the National University there. Uh, so he's a professor and 
and, and a military guy. And one of the things he said to me was, he's like, Pete, there are many Europes, right? And it had never occurred to me. I'm a well-traveled guy. I'm very educated. And to even be able to accept that lesson that Finland and Romania and Malta are all dramatically different places, have dramatically different goals, right. but are all still in Europe. I mean, think about how different Georgia is mm. from e even, you know, Azerbaijan and their neighbors, right? Right, but, right. So these are dramatically different things. You have your mind has to be prepared to receive a lesson as well mm. as because uh, you could say that someone is uneducated and they're like, yeah, whatever, I don't care, but. But mm -hmm. when you really understand international politics and, and relations mm -hmm. and security, Poland wants there to be a wall between them and Russia. There's nobody in Latvia that loves having Russian property to its west. You know, right. um, Finland has you guys have your own defense. We're not trying to get into military stuff too much here, but mm -hmm. Finland, Finland has their own ideas on defense against Russian incursions. Mm -hmm. These things aren't true for a lot of other a lot of other European countries. So when someone says something, you have to be in a position prepared enough to actually receive that message as well. All right. I think there's there's a saying, some kind of aphorism from, from Chinese philosophy that goes somewhere along these lines. It goes like, the teacher arrives when the students are ready. <laughs> and, and quite often it, it kind of forces us to be humble. You know, I think in, in the future work life, for example, you cannot survive if you are not willing to be a beginner every now and then, you know, like recognize the fact, okay, I don't know much and I don't know anything and I should be taught. Yeah. Yeah. We're talking with, with Pertu uh, about skills and wisdom because he's written a book called Future Skills. Uh, by the way, Pertu is, is uh, super young and he's one of those guys that is just way far out in front of his peers and often in front of me. And I'm, I'm about to become 52 soon, you know? So, uh, but it's not a competition, though. You no, know. I know, I know. But but right. your ability to process this stuff is is fantastic. Reading, I'm reading your book, and I'm like, man, this guy's got. He's just so on it. You're so smart about this, and you're so well reasoned. It's one thing to have an opinion, but you're reasoning through it in a way that is is consumable. Thank you very much. That, yeah. That's very very nice to hear. Thank you. <laughs> I wanted to ask you, you went to Singular, Singularity University. This is something that most people don't know about. And, but I, mm -hmm. I, I, I actually, I have, you're not the first person on the show who's been from Singularity University. That's why I know about it. But mm -hmm. I, I have a little bit of envy that people get to do this nowadays because when I was young, I, this would have been the perfect place for me. So talk mm -hmm. a little bit about the goal and what you gathered from your time there. Yeah. Well, first of all, I think I was very lucky to have been there when I was 21. I was the youngest in the course. And when you're at that age, you really like take everything in. Like you, you, you take all the knowledge, experience from your peers. And I think it really kind of changed the direction in my life. So I'm really grateful for that. But basically what we did there, we went through exponential technology. So how they work, what are they? How they change the world? We went through global grand challenges and tried to think, is there a way to combine these two? So can we solve the biggest problems using these new technologies? And it was, it was a good experience to, it kind of opened my eyes a lot and, and, and made me think. Obviously, the thinking, the worldview in Silicon Valley, you can challenge it. And, and, and when I went to Myanmar after that, for example, I, I noticed, I, I, I saw it very, you know, firsthand that maybe the technology doesn't solve all the problems. You know, there are things that technology is not the solution to. Um, but it really got me thinking, and that's the most important thing. And in all these kinds of courses, um, the people are always the most important part. So we had 80 students from 40 different countries. And obviously, the diversity, like we had different fields represented, different cultures. And, and the kind of conversations you have in that kind of setting is super, super interesting. So it was very nice to see that even though we are different, we have different backgrounds, future is something that really connects or, or kind of puts us all together. And, and it, it made me optimistic, I have to say. Like, it made me believe that we can actually solve these big problems and, and we can do something about it. And when in Finland, I had always thought the future is something abstract. It's happening over the other side of the world. You know, we, we, we don't have a say in that. Um, when I went there and I saw, hey, well, you are working at Google. You're working at Facebook. Like, these are the guys who are actually behind these, <laughs> these solutions. It became very kind of tangible that, okay, it's not something that 
just will happen one way or another, but it's something we actively you know, do every day. So it, it kind of gave me a good starting point to start my own career as an entrepreneur, you know, start talking about the future, write a couple of books. Um, I'm very grateful for the experience, but obviously um, uh, nothing is black and white. And, and, and in that sense, um, I, I can also like challenge some of the, you know, main messages they, they had. But anyway, very, very important part in my life. Yeah, it's neat. It's neat to, to hear the things that people talk about. And then also the, the work there is, I don't want to say so singular because that's just a little bit too punny, but <laughs> the people that come out of there all say the same thing. They've all said to me, I was so fortunate to get a chance to go. And then like one of them was a female. She was from a South American country. I'm not trying to identify her any more than that. But she said, I had no opportunity to do this kind of thing in the country that I came from. I was an entrepreneur. I was an entrepreneur down there. But every time I got going anywhere, my my gender held me up. And so I was desperate to break this mold. And so I came to the United States. Literally that day that, she, that I talked to her, they talked about females being held back in the U.S. as entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, how do you balance these realities? You have someone desperate to come here, go to Singularity University and literally change the world while we're told that these things aren't possible. And, and I'm with you. I'm pretty optimistic about the future because we are seeing these things. Uh, another friend of mine posted something recently about blockchain and how it's going to change how we assign value to, to farming, for example, so that we can, we can expand what the value is. We can understand this better. One of the best things when I talk about like blockchain and, and the use of like modern currency is when you look at like a, a parent who stays home to raise the kids, we're really bad at creating the value with that. When you start right. to use technology and start to say these things have value, we can better account for what is and isn't valuable. This is technology I mean, at its best. There's so much informal learning, informal knowledge that hasn't or doesn't translate into, you know, degrees or, or, or we don't see the numbers. Like uh, to your ex example, um, we have to take a test to drive a car, right? We have to take a test to hunt. Uh, there's no test to raise a child for 20 years. <laughs> so even though we kind of measure it, we kind of test it, doesn't mean that we can overlook it and i think right in those kinds of examples when we can create new value with this technology it's like super super interesting yeah it's funny you talk about tests one of the things i talk about quite a bit too is um you can buy any car you want right a car mm -hmm. with a thousand horsepower which is really a dangerous thing and you often see stories about someone buying a ferrari and instantly crashing it or some a young person buying a motorcycle like a super bike a thousand cc bike mm -hmm. There's no extra class to learn how to ride these things. Okay, sure, in California, you've got to take a motorcycle safety class. That's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about yeah. being able to control a performance vehicle at a high speed on a non-closed circuit, right? Mm -hmm. you, you get When you're young and you have no experience, you learn how to drive a car and then spend the rest of your life driving terribly and never have to go in to do anything to prove it ever again that you can you can't cut hair in the United States without yeah. having continuing <laughs> education. If you're going to, pardon the uh, vulgarity, if you're going to wax women's vaginas, you have to get a license and continue to educate yourself, right? Right. But raising a kid, driving a car, nothing. Mm. But, you know, it's it's because in Finland, for example, if, if you want to drive a car, um, you have to go to a test. And oftentimes we test the things that we have right and wrong answers to. Right. Mm -hmm. So, you know, these are the rules, you know, when it comes to mathematics, when it comes to grammatics at school, we can say that do it like this, don't do it like this. But when it, when it comes to raising a child or when it comes to any soft skill for that matter, you know, curiosity, compassion and perseverance, we don't have right and wrong answers the same way. Mm -hmm. it's, it's all about interpretation, like the context in which way is this better than the other option so when we don't have universal like right and wrong it's much more difficult to measure uh, and, and i guess that's why we haven't then been measuring these things because it's all about like how did you conduct that experiment um it's like personality tests you know it can give you the direction like okay this is something like who you are but it's not set in stone you know uh, the same way like berkeley innovation index is very good way to measure creativity that usually is quite difficult to measure 
Um, but still, it, it's not perfect. Yeah, it's not perfect. One of the other things uh, that I've noticed with folks who are in the AI, in the, uh, in, in the computer world, I'll say in general, mm -hmm. um, they want algorithmic answers to things that thus far we haven't really reliably created that. Amazon wants to guess what I want to buy. Uh, right. Spotify wants to guess what I want to watch next. Netflix wants to suggest things. And they have this sort of one-way model where like, we've identified your person and therefore, you know, it's an if then thing, but there should be, if mm -hmm. then did I get it right? Should be another value mm -hmm. because I, whenever YouTube's like, Hey, we recommended something. Did you like it? And I'm like, no, <laughs> no, because <laughs> you look at what I search, right? I, I had to go research you tomorrow. Mm -hmm. I've got an actress who was on a huge show in the seventies and eighties, totally different person. Mm -hmm. um, the person after that is a guy, it's like, they're all different. So I search all these crazy things. Right. And some algorithm tries to predict my, what I might want to watch. It's impossible mm. because I don't know what I'm going to watch next. Right, right. And, and it, in so many cases, we don't have the feedback loop at place at all. Like at school, for example, you know, what is the use of getting a degree, like getting a, you know, number on the test? In Finland, we use from four to 10, but in the States, let's say you get a B. Yeah. Um, if you don't ask after that, what did I do well? What did I do you know badly and, and what will I change next time? Because if we don't ask those questions, if we don't reflect at all, like what's the use of knowing if you're a C or B? If it's only like a stamp in your head, like you're good, you're bad, it doesn't really help at all. So it, it always kind of comes back to what did we learn from this? Like is this feedback loop like did the recommendation work or not? Yeah. The also uh you're talking about education and we're kind of just doing some background stuff here we're going to talk about the book in a minute but one of the things too about being a parent and educating a kid or watching your kid get educated uh it's very possible that a single bad test you know whether they are prepared or not can teach the kid that they are bad at tests right and, and no one's taught them a strategy and how to take a test so now you're teaching a kid how to take a test instead of being prepared uh, so they get overly nervous. The other thing we do poorly, at least here in America, is we have this obsession with STEM, right? And STEM's important. We're not saying it's not. But if you are a kid who's mathematically inclined and mm. STEM is easy for you because you're just built this way, right? Yeah. And then you have an artistic kid who's like, like me, I'll tell you a joke. I'll stand in front of a crowd. No problem. So if I take yeah. speech class, I'm going to get an A. I'm going to got to try, right? It's so mm. easy for me. But if I go to math class, oh, my God, I'm going to struggle so bad. Like, I understand math, but I'm just not an algebraic kind of person. You take us and you put us, you, you put the other kid and you say, you've got to go through an advanced speech class to get to the next level. And that kid who's super STEM smart, maybe even on the spectrum, is going to be like, oh, he's going to freak out about having to stand up. I'll go first. I don't even care. Right. Right. But, but we don't treat these things equally. We, we make the kid who's good at math be like, oh, hey, don't worry about it. The kid who's bad at math they're like you have to you have to work harder you know right 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 you know in, in general at schools i would say that we we are very much focused on what to think mm. but not how to think like okay when when i realized that well i can like control my thoughts i, I can control my approach like i, I can i can work my, on my mindset uh, there's a huge you know, breakthrough for, for me and, and i i guess we should do that more at, at schools, you know, how to see things, how to you know, approach things. So that would be very valuable, I think. And, and in those cases where you get a degree or you get, uh, I mean, a, like a test result, um, it would be super important to kind of know how this helps me. How do I take it? How do I let it affect me? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I've spent a lot of times working in places like Afghanistan and in mm. Iraq. And so I've seen how big institutions struggle to create the outcomes they want. And I, mm. I think this is what we're talking about in general here is when we look at trying to build people who are future capable, if we don't study externally what mm. the outcome is, right? Like uh, we talk about diversity all the time, at least here in the United States, right? And uh, mm. and I know, I know from working in, in and around a lot of technology companies, they talk about diversity, but then you look at the result and you're really getting the same people over and over again. They all have degrees, same kind of degrees from the same kind mm -hmm. of places. And they're not in any way politically diverse. They're very mm -hmm. bad at being um, ageist, right? And all of a right. sudden you realize that these are actually, <laughs> they're, 
they're good at ethnic diversity, but they're bad at any other kind of diversity. Right, right, right. You don't right. have that external eye to go, hey, how come there's no one here who's 50 years old who just graduated from, you know, whatever? Uh, right. I don't know. Chicken you know, I, like, if I, if I asked people, like, okay, you, you are, let's say you can, you can do whatever you want for one day in the world. You're a dictator. And your job is to solve, you know, climate change. Um, yeah. What would you do? Well, the answers vary a lot depending on who I ask, right? Because if I ask a politician, the, the way they think, how they approach this problem would be, of course, we have to make new laws and regulation, and that's how we change the world. But if I ask an entrepreneur, they won't say, you know, regulation. <laughs> they will say that, well, we are much faster, much more agile than any government. So, so we have the response. We have the speed, right, to really make a change. If I ask a teacher, they will say it all starts from education, obviously, right? Uh, if I ask a futurist, they will guarantee that this new technology will, you know, make it all better. And if I ask an artist, yeah. they will say that, well, you know, we, we need motivation in order to change our you know, behavior and patterns. So we need to make music and culture and movies so that people want to change. This is how we can, as a humanity, you know, take the next. So everybody gives me a different answer because they are so good in their own kind of field. Yeah. They don't realize that this is only one way to, you know, this is how I'm wired to solve problems. And, and, and especially with these complex problems we have in the future and have already now, it would be so important to have these different people all come to the same table and tell what, in their opinion, is the problem here. Because we might not even agree on what is the problem. <laughs> so how could we even then solve it? So what you're saying is, is that you should take anybody that doesn't agree with you and denigrate them and treat them like crap and belittle their... <laughs> because <laughs> this is what we actually do, right? You're like, yeah. you don't agree with me. You're dumb. You're an idiot. And... And, and yes, we never get to sit down and go, hey, we need an artist in here. I mean, I totally agree with this. You have to have that artist element. You know, how, okay, how are we going to approach this? What are the mm -hmm. things that we'd like to see happen as we do it? Like, if you're going to build a new highway system, Texas in our, in our country is building hi highway construction like crazy. Mm -hmm. And so it's going to be ugly because there's no one there. It's all engineers, right? And so it's going right. to be effective. It's going to move people around. But it's not going to be as nice as driving through France and seeing their freeway system. You know, I think one way to see that what you just described is that we can make things more effective, but they don't necessarily become better. Yeah. And, and I think that's a very important kind of notion to make because nowadays when we digitalize processes and we, we kind of, we, what we want is we want to optimize. We want to make it more effective. And at some point, if we, for example, take the human out of the loop, um, we make it very cost effective, right? Cheap and, and optimized, but it doesn't become better. Like we yeah. want to have the human element there. If I go to a library or, or to a shop or to a bank, of course, robots could run them already. <laughs> but even though it's more effective, it's not better. So we have to kind of make the distinction that always mm -hmm. the more effective option is not better. Sometimes, of course, they go hand in hand, but um, it's always good to kind of ask, are we losing something in this transition? Yeah. And I don't know how this would translate into Finnish, but one of the things that I've learned is that affect beats effect. You know, so as an entrepreneur, you can have a better Google. Good luck. Because right. you, can't, you can't change the affect very reliably, mm -hmm. you know? And yeah. so how do you how do you get that response, that, that affect, the response to stimuli, right? So I'm going to create this environment how do I gather people? You, you're the worst yeah. entrepreneur in the world if, if you have the best machine ever and nobody cares. Right, right, right. Now, I think too often we value speed over depth. You know, we, we want to see the results, you know, very soon and very quick. And and that seems to be like a value in itself. Like, show me how, how fast can you go. But if we have the wrong direction, like we're doing the wrong things, it doesn't really matter at all. And, and we're lacking depth, you know, the experience that we're not asking the important questions. And at this point, sometimes it feels like, hey, we are succeeding in things that don't matter at all. <laughs> like yeah. We are very good and we're growing and we're getting forward, but it's all for nothing because now the problems we're leading to, you know, the challenges we have to be 
and 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 it feels like well yes we are good at measuring activity like what happened between this and this time but we can't really measure the cost of something that was not done <laughs> you know what, what is the price of things we left undone and, and and right now it feels like i'd like to remind people that it's not only what you see like how fast we went how far we were able to climb um but rather what didn't we do and what was the call yeah. of that yeah, this is a good point. We just went through a whole thing here <clears throat> in the U.S. and and our allies mm. in Afghanistan. You know, we thought we had built something that would last at least a few minutes, but the reality mm. was, and I worked at the ground level, right? And I, I'm like, nothing here works. Like, what's stable about a country that has no roads, no electricity, no cell phone towers, no fire department, no banks, no way to gather taxes? Like, what's stable about that? Like, right. We shouldn't expect this to last any length of time. But because we didn't have the, we don't allow the mavericks to come in and say, hey, there's problems all over the place. We need to mm -hmm. slow down this progress we think we're having and get really granular, you know, before you automate something. Gosh, you got to know what the heck is going on on the ground. Right, right. Yeah. When you, when you decided to write this book, okay, first off, you're a busy dude, right? And, and as, as young people often are, you're like, writer slash speaker slash musician slash 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 because you're still sort of sorting out your voice and this is no way to denigrate you it's just a young person thing where yeah. you take on a lot of things why did you need to write this book and are you going to continue to write do you think yeah um so after i got back from silicon valley and i was basically brainwashed in a good sense i guess <laughs> I, I i i sometimes feel a bit you know I don't know if relentless is the right word or, you know, restless, maybe restless, you know, because I felt like these visions, these, these technologies are wonderful, of course, but in, in wrong hands, they can create a lot of bad things. And, and I feel like the technology has already improved so quickly that we as humans haven't really, we haven't been able to keep up. And right now they are having you know, the hold on us. And what we would need right now is to focus on humans you know, rather than the technology. So understanding what is important for us humans, like how do we tick? And so I felt like I want to share the message. I want to talk mm. to people about these issues. And I started doing keynotes in Finland. And of course, I didn't have any, any name. Nobody knew me. I was a like 20, what, two, three-year-old guy. So yeah. I started like ground up. I did one keynote, which led to another, then led to a couple of more. And it went all, all the way to a situation where I had like 200 keynotes in one year in like 10 different countries before COVID. And I felt like, okay, this is wonderful. I get to you know share these ideas and visions, but it's mostly for people in these like boardrooms and, and you know seminars and conferences, which is cool. But what about all the teachers, all the students, all the parents? Because I want to reach those people as well. And I've seen that, okay, this material that I have, these ideas that I have really resonate. So why don't I just put them into a book? And that way I could really, you know, help other people, you know, get um, kind of introduced to those ideas as well. And I wrote it so that really a young person could read it. Like I've heard the 10 year old has read it and an eight year old. So I wanted yeah. to make it like, there are sophisticated ideas and, and, and complex stuff but still it's written in a way that there's no jargon there's no like difficult words you don't have to know everything about technology for example so i wrote this book because i i really felt that you know i want to you know give this or share these these ideas to parents that have children i want to have make students excited about the future i want to really just spark some ideas and then thoughts uh, in the people who really at the end of the day you know define the direction our societies will develop mm -hmm. into so uh, that's kind of the, the motivation to it. And of course, I first wrote it in Finnish. And in Finland, it did very well, it became a bestseller. And now it's been published in the US and in Korean, in Turkish, and hopefully other, other languages as well. And then I wrote a second book and probably many more in the future. But that's yeah. kind of my first one. And, and it's been really nice to see that, you know, it, it has sparked some ideas. So I really hope that people in the US find it. <laughs> Yeah. Well, listen, everybody should get future skills. The link for it is there on the uh, the thing. If you're listening on the podcast side, it'll be in the show notes. The, the uh, I enjoyed it. it. The book is it's short. It's easy to read. Like you said, it's mm -hmm. not super jargony. And 
It, it, it puts you in a, look, it puts you in a more positive mind about the future. There's plenty of bad news out there. Right. There's also a lot of really good news. I mean, there are a lot of good things. We've covered a lot of like problems with institutions and, and with AI and everything, but there's we're also getting better. And one of the things I learned from from popping the bubble was never bet against software engineers because <laughs> they will continue to creep and solve and slowly ameliorate problems that yes. I mean, life can life can be and will continue to get better in so many ways. Yes, we have big problems. Um, a lot of these problems, this just in, existed when Sumeria was the biggest, baddest country in the world. And that's a long time ago. So yeah. you know, we can't, it's hard to solve the Sumerian level problems, but we, famine is a lot less frequent. Uh, you know, we survive giant problems like a, a tsunami or a hurricane mm -hmm. a lot better now than we used to. You know, we, we were able to, I just had some guys on the show the other day and they're, they're, they work on the nature side of things and they're trying to reintroduce red-legged red frogs to Southern California, right? Mm -hmm. And there's technology involved in this. And, and there's, because there's so many people here, there are now canyons that used to be dry that are now mm -hmm. wetlands because of all of the runoff from the houses on the hills. And oh. so they can reintroduce frogs to these areas and do it with better knowledge. And as a company that, that focuses on bees, and like bees are one of the smartest things in the animal kingdom. Yeah. Um, let's take all of this combined knowledge about bees and start giving it to farmers so that we can build better bees, more efficient bees, teach because right. bees can learn. And so these are some of the gifts that are being given to us. Let's talk a little bit about the positive stuff you've seen. Yeah, I mean, what you basically described there is like, because now we have a way to share the knowledge, you know, because of internet. Um, the rate of innovation, the rate of kind of best practices, you know, around the world is only going to increase. And I think that's one of the best things ever. Like if we didn't have internet and we had climate change, how would we begin to tackle that kind of solution? Like if we didn't have internet, we had COVID, how would we even like stay on the same boat? So in, in, in many ways, I, I see a lot of potential there. And we have to remember that not only like everybody's not online yet. So there's like still some 3 billion people coming online in the next years, which means whatever we are seeing right now, it's only the beginning, you know, just wait until we have the rest of the world <laughs> join us. And of course, all the bad things as well, you know, all the trolls and fake news and whatnot, they will too increase. So uh, this is really some kind of tipping point. Like we can use these technologies to do incredible things. We can really, you know, we, we can research uh, and, and examine everything between like cells to galaxies. But if we don't use these technologies um, to do something good, you know, why didn't we even, you know, use these technologies? Like uh, what I'm trying to say is that, you know, the technology doesn't make us better. It helps us share knowledge. It helps us, you know, you know maybe, it helps us kind of do good, but the technology alone is not a good teacher. So we have to kind of remember the balance, like the technology alone won't kind of solve the problems. I guess that's what I'm trying to say. One of the things technology hasn't sorted out, or maybe it has, I don't know, but it's in America, our politicians are bad at consensus building. It's always us mm -hmm. versus everybody else, right? right? And that's no way to govern uh, a country. This just in, that's crap. So... <laughs> Do you think we'll be able to use technology to not compel consensus, but to create consensus? Right. I think when it comes to like us versus them, them, um, we should somehow create a situation where it's just us. You know, I don't think that we can create belonging by creating kind of distinction or creating these like different camps, like. I, I, I don't think we need the bad guy in order to <laughs> go up right like the bad. Like we should we should find the common ground, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, but usually, uh, I have to say that you know the bad things and the bad guys um, are much better at kind of organizing. And, and when there's a threat, you know something bad, it's very tangible. It's like okay, this is something we don't want. This is something we're against. But then when there's something good, you know, in the future, a vision. It just it's not that tangible <laughs> like like we haven't been able to really connect people that well when it's only been something abstract well Martin Luther King said I have a dream like that was a vision right and he was able to do that 
but oftentimes the bad things kind of bring us together you know more effectively than the good things because the good things are abstract they're somewhere there to happen sometime in the future so we should really kind of try to I, I guess make it more tangible the future the good things we are after like the things we want to achieve and that way we will be able to create more belonging without creating like the other guy that we're against it's, it's more like it's all of our future it's all of our kind of the other day I was watching TV yeah. and here in California, we struggle with wildfires, right? We're not sure what to do about them. We argue mm -hmm. about it. And uh, there was a guy talking about a strategy like once a, a tree falls during a forest fire, you mm -hmm. have to leave that tree there because it acts as a temporary fire break, right? And this guy's a PhD, studied it. And he's like written papers about it. In the same piece, they go to the expert who's similarly PhD. These guys probably know each other. And he's like, you absolutely can't do that. That's completely wrong. You have to remove these fallen trees. Right. So you have two sides of this equation. Like we're all desperate to do better at fire. And you have to pick your expert. You pick your side. Mm -hmm. And so I'm hoping that as technology gets better, one of the things when we discuss academic papers and you mm -hmm. probably know this, but when you talk about a peer review paper, it's talking about one tiny little element of a problem, right? And so mm -hmm. these guys can simultaneously disagree and both be correct because they're talking about slightly different elements of the right. same problem, right? And so it seems like we need some matrix, not matrix like the movie, but like a matrix yeah. of knowledge where you can access and see which part of the puzzle we're actually talking about, you know, mm -hmm. and which layer of the puzzle. Are we talking about the cardboard or are we talking about the image, you know? Right, right. And I, I guess, like, uh, what we have seen already happen um, is that even though we are, you know, kind of intellectual, so we refer to research, you know, right. um, we still too often start to fight <laughs> with that, like, piece of research. Like, yeah. uh, let me say, okay, there, there is this World Economic Forum report that says it like this. If you don't think the same way, you're an idiot. Like, why would you challenge this authority? Well, I have this Harvard professor, you know, he says it did. So, so we kind of use these sources to fight against each other. And I guess at that point, it's all about winning and not kind of creating un like understanding. And, and I guess the, the, the goal of a you know conversation or any argument is not to beat the other one, but create understanding, right? So I guess it's it's. Uh, we, we should really focus on like our, our I don't know what the word is in English but you know the culture how we have these conversations you know it, it, is your personal opinion more important than your loved ones really <laughs> like would, would you still choose your like what does it help if you're right and alone yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. like why would you rather like wouldn't you like rather to be with other people and like live together like like is your opinion really that important to you and anyway this i think oh, we could talk about this for an hour but it makes yeah. me frustrated you know like we are we are better well, than that one of the things as someone who collects wisdom for a living one of the things that i've learned is that we're wrong a lot more often than we ever keep track of and who keeps track of how often they're wrong right, right. okay sure you're going to keep track of it but even, even then you don't know like were you right because mm -hmm. we have a lot of things where we talk about, I don't know, some experience and you talk about it from another point of view. And all of a sudden you're like, well, that's not that's not what I experienced at all. I mean, I've literally been in villages talking to people and, and just by asking different questions without my perspective being important, understanding the other perspective, right. you come back with this completely alternate reality. Mm -hmm. And this happens all the time. So I started to learn, oh, my God, I'm wrong probably as often as I'm right. You right. know, and, and until I can prove otherwise, I'm just going to assume that I'm wrong way more often than I think I'm right. Yeah. And to be more patient, to be more tolerant. Mm -hmm. I guess one way to look at it is that, you know, as we grow, as we learn more, we just become less wrong. <laughs> like, <laughs> we, we don't, we are not right. We're just like little by little, we are less wrong and then less wrong than that and so on. Yeah. Uh, back to those guys with the trees. One of the things too about that is if you read any academic papers, they're not binary. You know, they're they're never binary. They're right. look when you read the conclusion, they're going to be very forceful, and this is where their opinion can come in. But the rest of the paper, it's like more likely than not, 
some of the time, you know, mm-hmm. there is an increase. There is a, a slight correlation. It's never a correlation <laughs> of one. Never, ever, ever. And yeah. so we have this opinion that all Finns love fudge. Well, that's yeah. just not going to be true. It might right, be 50% right. true, but not not 52, mm-hmm. not 80, not 100, you know? Yeah. You know, one thing that I did at the end of the, like, editing process when I was writing the book is that I, I searched all the like universal words you know never always yes. none and just deleted all of them because you know naturally we make these mistakes that we write like it never happens like it always and it's never the case right yeah. so i i wanted to kind of go through my own text and just make sure that i won't I, i'm not making this huge like generalization and and, and you know so, so I guess that's something we should all remember. That it's never, never. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's not, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. I, I want to mention something else too. As a guy, uh, he was a really incredible um, management leadership author. His name is Peter Drucker. He's passed on, but he wrote books for fifty plus years. And he's like, okay, if you've read book number you know, fifty-two, um, remember what I said back in book fifteen that this was this way? I was wrong. And so if you read book 15, but never read book 52, you, you're getting the wrong lesson. <laughs> right, right, right. I wonder if the same thing happens to me. So in, in a couple of years, I'm like, I have an updated version. You know? This is what I'm talking about. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, it, I mean, already, I mean, I, I can say it very clearly that over, like, it's only natural that over time you get more nuances and more, I right. like, so, so that if you sometimes feel a bit stupid, like, how thoughtless I was back in the day or like how naive I was. It's a good sign. It just tells you that you have evolved. You have learned something. So it's a good thing to kind of be a bit ashamed of the past, for example. Good. And then the other thing, I'm just curious, what are some of the things, as you've written the book, the future moves so fast, technology moves almost as fast. Right. What what has already evolved that you're like, "Ah, dang it, I'd like another crack at this book and write another chapter Mm -hmm. right now. Well, actually, I, I was kind of aware of that when I started writing because uh, I think it's like in the first pages when I say that the things that change are, of course, interesting and nice, but that's not the most important or more most interesting thing at all. The things that don't change is what we should really focus on because that's something we can rely on. That's something we can trust not to go away. So it's much more valuable to find the things that will stay the same. And when it comes to skills, of course, philosophy, fine arts, these human skills, they will never go away. So it would be a very safe investment to make to study those things and kind of be yeah. good at those things. So I kind of wanted to kind of make make sure that I'm, I'm not making predictions or this kind of stuff that will then, you know, be outdated very soon, but rather ask the question, what, like, is this book, these, these thoughts, are they going to last in time? And I tried to really approach it that way. So things that won't go away, won't become obsolete. In the book, early on, you use the example of being a kid and spinning around. You talk about this also in your TED Talk. It's one of your central uh, teaching points, right? Yes. How did you come up with that? And it's brilliant, by the way, because you can come back and be like, and then I rotated and I evolved and I turned again and I considered this from a different point of view. It's just a brilliant thing. Talk about the evolution of that process and that, 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 you know, that teaching tool. So, so basically, um, like what that experience taught me. So, yeah, and how did you realize that this was going to be a central theme for your, your talks and everything else? Like, mm. it's such a no, I, I, yeah. So, so maybe a little bit of background for those who, who, who don't know what the spinning <laughs> story is about. Yeah. So, when I was in, in, in um, kindergarten, we faced a like problem, like we didn't know what makes a person wiser than another. So, we asked our teacher this question, and, and he said that. And, and jokingly, we didn't know we were five years old, but he said that the more you rotate, um, the wiser you get. Because older people have been here you know, for a longer time. They have had more opportunities to rotate and the world spins all right. So that's why older people are more, more, you know, they're wiser. So we went out and like spread our arms out wide and started spinning, thinking that we're doing ourselves a great service. And, and later on, obviously we learned that, okay, that's not what makes you wise. Um, but when I, when I played with this thought, I, I, I thought, well, actually, the more times you have changed your perspective, the more times you have changed how you approach things, probably wiser you are. So after like 
two decades, I learned that he was right at the end of the day. Like, like he, he had a point. There's another day actually um, when we didn't know what makes people die, you know, and, and we asked again our teacher, like, why do people die? And, and this time he he, he, he he lied. He said that, you know, when you leak blood, blood gets out, um, there's only a certain amount of blood in your body. And when you live up to 70, 80 year olds, you have like hurt yourself so many times, little by little, the blood all has run out. And when you lose all the blood, you die. And a couple of days later, when we hit our knees somewhere and then, you know, got a scratch, we were like panicking, like, oh my gosh, like in incredibly precious years are leaking out and like quickly somebody put, and, and we thought that, okay, that's why the parents always make us kind of be careful because they don't want us to die too early because of the blood leaking out. <laughs> and, um, just like a couple of stories to, to start the book with, but um, I guess like th there's always wisdom in those um, stories. Like like uh, I I just thought that it would be nice to share those things. I guess the big question we should ask are what are some of the future skills that you identified that maybe aren't obvious? Mm. Um, I would say perseverance has become a skill um of course yes it's a virtue and it's always been important but i think in today's very hectic environment when we want quick fixes right and we want to have you know results immediately and everything has to happen easily and fast um we are not always very good at you know at staying or keeping the course for, for a long time. Like I would say that if you want to achieve anything great in your life, you have to learn how to commit because that brings, you know, death, that brings meaning and fulfillment. So if our way of living is very short sighted, you know, um, we are, we cannot learn, you know, some things that take very long time to learn. You know, there are things in life that you learn only like let's, let's say it this way, it takes years to learn. You know, there are some things in life that you only learn at like midpoint of your life. And, and we have to kind of remember that not everything happens easily and fast. So in, in that sense, perseverance and the ability to stick to one thing at a time, I think it's, it's super important that it might not be um, um, like uh, clear to, to everybody. Um, and other thing I would say is honesty. Um, of, yes, again, it's always been important, but why is it a skill? Well, because in social media, we have become very good at like showcasing a certain side of ourselves. We're very good kind of actors, all of us. We can manage the view we are giving out. And, and in that world, I think we have all, all already recognized that that's not interesting. Like, we know that's not true. Like, you know, the, the perfect photos and, and, and post and whatnot. And, and we crave, we, we want to have something authentic, something real. And in that sense, honesty, like ability, maybe the courage to show who you are as you are is super important because it connects people. You know, you, you bring something, let's say you, you bring a real vulnerability on the table. Um, it, it, it strengthens relationships, it, it deepens relationships. So it has become a skill. And, and also I think compassion is kind of the other side of the coin because when somebody is honest, and it's not always nice. Then how do you, how do you, how do you take it? Like how, how do you have the skill to be compassionate? And um, I, I think these things are kind of something that has emerged from these digital technologies taking over so quickly that they have created a new kind of need for these types of skills. And, and, and um, we need to counterbalance, I guess, these these uh, developments with this very profound humane skills. It's more important now than ever, I would say. Yeah, yeah. One of the skills that I've picked up along the way that I think is a good future skill is, um, so I, I, I'm in this uh, this group and we have an email list and a Discord server and all this kind of thing. And we talk and it's it's, it's funny, this group is full of really, really, really well-credentialed people. And so mm. all of us kind of universally, individually will say, and I kind of gather this knowledge, so so I, I'm, I'm aware of it. Like, I personally feel like, I don't, I don't know why they have me in this group. Like, they're all so accomplished, right? And then the other that's guy, how like, I oh, that's right. how I feel in singularity, right? The yeah. imposter. Right, yeah. right. You're like, how are they letting me in here? And then the next guy's like, hey, man, do you feel like you don't belong? You know, and so if everybody feels this way, 
yeah. you know, you're forced to kind of be the better version of you. And maybe you're more measured and, and maybe you don't say as ridiculous things as you might do to your friends. But boy, do I learn a lot in this group. And, and so this ability to not only see things from other perspectives, but to be in a group where everybody believes everybody else is like playing at a higher level than them, you know you're in something that's really magical and, and it allows you to grow. And I don't know what you call that skill, but mm -hmm. this is something that I've learned as an adult and fairly recently. Yeah, and I, I mean, some kind of perception, I guess, because I, I have trained the muscle to see something from – each one of them, like every people that I encounter, that I would want to learn from them, like something that I, I I'm idolizing this person about, and I think it yeah. is a skill that you can train, like how, like see good examples around you, like see good features, like spot things that you want to be and become. Um, I think it's super important to kind of, if you want to develop yourself, if you want to grow, um, you need to have examples, you need to have um, idols. So pick, like, find the, the kind of examples you want to um, be like. Yeah, no, that's great. And, and I want everybody to go out and get future skills. There's the link on the screen. Again, if you're listening on the podcast side, just look in the notes. You'll see it in there. I see that Dickie already bought it. Awesome. Thank you, Dickie, for doing that. If you guys want more on, on, on Prayer 2, just go to his website. And if you can't find that, that again will be in the show notes and everything else. Hey, listen, I mean, I've had you for an hour. I, I think it's been a great jaunt through a lot of different things, just kind of getting your ideas and thoughts. We don't commonly like talk just about the book because someone else is going to do that. But I read it. I think it's fantastic. And, and it's one of those books that I feel like I can read it again and again because I'm still processing a lot of, of what you said. And then it's like something happens and I'm like, oh yeah, I read that earlier. And, and that's sort of how I read books anyhow. I just kind of continue to, to push through them. So, so thanks so much for writing it. I guess what I want to ask you last is uh, I often turn the mic around and I say, hey, do you want to ask me a question at all? Hmm. Well, I would maybe ask something about future skills because you are older than me and, and you have seen a lot. You, you have a lot of experience. Um, what is a skill that has helped you the most yeah. in life or what you would rely on in the future? Like what is something that you will hold on to because that's so important? Yeah. I mean, it, it, there's a couple of things that I learned um, primarily because I was a spy, right? So my job was to go out and talk to people and get to know the worst people I could find and also understand what we were doing as the coalition forces in whatever country we were in. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I learned are two things. One of the things is, is um, this Afghan governor said to me, there's only room for one sword in the scabbard, meaning he is the sword. He is the leader. So you take mm -hmm. that to the commander and you're like, there's only room for one sword in the scabbard. What do you want to do about that? And he's like, this is perfect. He's the sword. We're all going to work to support him. You know, mm -hmm. it's hard, though, for a commander to do that because their job is to impose will. And right. close with and destroy. So you have to balance this ethos. Right. We mm -hmm. talk about. We talk about empathy a lot, but we don't talk about CQ, cultural intelligence, that acuity mm. to balance things, right? I like that. Yeah. And then the other thing that I've learned is, is that whatever the institution says is probably wrong because they haven't taken mm. time to study the actual output of what they're doing. So when, um, especially culturally, so when Jeff Bezos is like, we're building a culture of positivity and togetherness. And if I go around Amazon and I talk to people and they're like, absolutely not. There's, you know, miserness and, and I'm not, so this is, I'm just using, I'm just using Amazon as an example. I'm not saying this right. is true, but if you were to go out and test their culture, I, I bet you wouldn't find what they think is true. And so if that is true, then what other mistakes are they making in mm -hmm. their approach to things, whether it's legislation for, for the policies and the, of a government or it's uh, the output of a corporation, whatever they're saying is not going to be as true as you want. Not that they're trying to lie. But they don't take the time to study their actual output and go, oh, let's twist these knobs within the machine to make this better outcome happen. Right. It's interesting. Thank you for the answer. <laughs> no problem. Well, listen, I appreciate you coming here. Let's uh, let's do it again. you got a lot of books to write. I'd love to talk to you again sometime soon. Yes. Thanks for taking the time. I really appreciate it. No, no worries. Okay, let me sign this thing off. Stand by for a second. Hey, thanks for watching the show. I really appreciate it. And right here, you can subscribe. Please do that. It makes the show grow. Hit that notification bell so you know which incredible guest is coming up next. Down below is the PayPal link. You can put a small subscription in. That is an enormous help. All that money goes right back into the show. And then right up over here, 
are the next episodes you should listen to, curated by yours truly. Thank you so much for watching this.